Well, why don't we start with uh, some of the false claims that are out there and maybe you can clear some things in the air and I'll ask you the first question and I I want to know the truth behind NAD. Without going so deep into the education behind it, maybe not even touching on the Krebs cycle, I think there is a lot of people out there capitalizing on NAD IVs. I'd love to understand NR, NMN and then NAD. Sure. So, okay, so let's start with that. So, so NAD is central cofactor for lots and lots of different chemical reactions in every cell in our bodies, in every animal cell on this planet. And it's, you know, probably on the order of thousands of different chemical reactions that NAD participates in. So it's super important. The NAD molecule has several precursors that during the synthesis of NAD are used to make NAD. And that's where things like NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide, NR, nicotinamide riboside, There's also niacin and nicotinamide are the other two cofactors that can be taken orally. And the idea is if you take those as pills, you will increase the level of NAD in your body. It will get into circulation, get turned into NAD, get into your cells, and you'll have more NAD to carry out these reactions. So that's the concept. We can talk about, you know, how important is it to get more NAD in your body? That's one question, I think. Um, But then another way to do it is these NAD drips. And the reason why you would do NAD as an IV as opposed to orally is because NAD itself, the molecule, is not bioavailable. So that's why you would take the precursors if you wanted to take a pill, or you could go into a clinic and by IV get NAD put directly into your circulatory system. But the goal is the same. The goal is to increase NAD levels available for your cells to use for these chemical reactions. So all of this relies on the idea that that's a good thing, that we need more NAD. And that I think, you know, there's some science to support that in certain people in certain cases. And But there are also lots of questions whether or not that's true for everyone. And And this is where I think we also need to be clear whether we're talking about longevity per se. So, you know, when I think of longevity, I use sort of the literal definition. Are we talking about trying to increase lifespan and or health span? So I'll include health span in that. And most of the time when we're talking about that, we're talking about doing that by targeting the biology of aging, the biological mechanisms that underlie the aging process. So it is a hypothesis that has gotten a lot of traction that with age, NAD levels decline. If that's true, then increasing NAD levels might have some benefits. I think I say if it's true because it's not clear at all that that's generally true. It's sort of become dogma and gotten amplified, but it's not really clear that NAD levels always decline with age in every animal or certainly not in every person. So my sort of personal feeling is that NAD precursors or NAD drips could be beneficial for some people, probably not beneficial for all people. And when you look at the literature, it's a really real mixed bag in the sense that there have been some studies that report NAD can increase lifespan in laboratory animals, have some health benefits in people, other studies that failed to replicate those initial studies. So it's really hard to know with a lot of confidence how solid is this. I put it in a, I'd say it's a solid maybe right now. Um, I'm not saying there's no value to NAD precursors. I'm not saying that NAD isn't important for aging. I think it probably is, but it's a very complicated situation. And I, I don't think there's much evidence that just taking an NAD precursor or getting an NAD drip is going to generally be a positive thing for most people. The last thing I'll say on this, I know there's, a, there's a lot of confusion about the different precursors that are out there. So again, NMN, NR, niacin, nicotinamide. There's also nicotinic acid riboside, but that's less common. Um, They'll all do the same thing. You can take them as pills. They probably all get broken down into nicotinamide or niacin by the gut microbiome, get taken up that way, and then get resynthesized back to NAD. So there are people who will sell you very expensive NMN and NR pills. Not much evidence that if taking an NAD precursor is valuable, but that's a better way to do it than taking the very cheap nicotinamide or or niacin. And I don't really know a lot about the NAD drips. I've heard, again, anecdotal stories, but I, I haven't seen anything that makes me really believe they are, you know, particularly beneficial. I haven't tried it myself, so I can't say from experience one way or the other. Yeah, I, um, I, I've, I've heard a mixed bag of reviews. I've heard that it doesn't penetrate the cell. I've heard that uh, if you have NR or NMN, you can increase NAD levels intracellularly. So it just, it's just so, it doesn't make sense to me. I hear it. And then you look at all the different specialties um, amongst physicians. And there's a lot of fertility doctors who are actually telling people to 
take a lot of women who are having problems um, with fertility or even with low AMH, low uh, egg reserve, to do NAD. And I hear reports of they've increased they've increased uh, their egg count, which I also yeah. thought um, didn't exist. So I just hear so many different differing opinions. Yeah, and I mean, I think um, there is a little bit of evidence from animal studies. This is in mice now that at least in certain situations, NAD precursors can boost fertility in female mice that are going through the normal aging process. The same thing's true with rapamycin. I don't know if we'll talk about rapamycin. So again, the idea here is if you are effectively targeting the biology of aging, you might have a positive impact on the natural decline in fertility. I'm not aware of any evidence in people. And I think one of the things we see in this space right now is a, um, a very low threshold to go right from a single animal study into humans, especially with something like a, a supplement that isn't regulated. There are, there seem to be lots, well, definitely there are lots of companies that will sell you these products, but there seem to be a growing number of medical professionals who, in my view, are taking a pretty cavalier approach and going right from a single mouse study to prescribing these to their patients without any, any way of really knowing whether or not these therapies are beneficial, potentially harmful, you know, what, how it's all going to wash out in the end. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one thing to actually see the results like increasing cellular NAD, but it's another thing to know if it's actually having a positive effect. Well, even that, I think most of the time people aren't measuring cellular NAD, you know, what they will typically do. I mean, I guess maybe if you talk about blood cells, but what they'll typically do is take a blood sample and, and measure NAD levels directly from blood. Even that's non-trivial. So I think there is a technical component here that people don't always appreciate, which is that there's there's the total amount of NAD, but there's a reduced version of NAD called NADH. Mm. And so the, the what you're actually often measuring, right, is not the total amount of those two molecules, but only the NAD. But depending on how you process the sample, you can you can dramatically change that ratio because it's just an oxidation reaction. So all I'm saying is it's not it's not trivial to do a good job of measuring quantitatively NAD levels. And so even when people say that they see a change in NAD, it's not always the case that we really know how a accurate that is. And it's going to be a while until we have the true randomized control trials to back it up. Yeah, I mean, there have been a few very small trials, sometimes randomized, sometimes not. But none of them are, I mean, they're all designed to really be safety trials, and none of them are really designed to show efficacy. So it doesn't have to be a long time, but it probably will be a long time simply because, you know, there's no profit motive, really, because these are these are generally recognized as safe molecules. Anybody, any supplement company can sell them. There's really no motive to do the, the very well-controlled large-scale clinical trials. I will say there have been a couple, mostly around things like Parkinson's disease that look intriguing. Again, you know, not definitive, but like I said, in, intriguing early results. I think those are with nicotinamide riboside primarily. So, you know, I think it'll, we'll have to wait and see. If I had to guess, I would guess there probably are certain conditions where you have particular types of mitochondrial dysfunction where supplementing with an NAD precursor could be beneficial. I'm pretty, and so that could be something like Parkinson's disease or other disorders where you have specific types of mitochondrial dysfunction. I'm pretty skeptical that for the typical person supplementing with an NAD precursor is going to do much. Um, it might do a little bit, but it's probably not going to really move the needle.